Okay, welcome all. Uh, I wish to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people who are the, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and our region. It is a pleasure for ASPE to host this event on the next phase of counter-terrorism, counter-violent extremism, and ensuring we have the national resilience to both manage the risks and maintain our social cohesion. It is my particular pleasure that we have Saad Massani all the way from Italy, providing key remarks before our expert panel session with Matt Anderson and Siobhan Hinu, moderated by Karcha Theodorakis. Saad is the co-founder and chairman of Moby Group, bringing top tier news and media content to emerging and frontier markets over the past two decades. He was ranked by Time Magazine in 2011 as one of the 100 most influential people in the world and recognized by the Asian Society as a game changer for bringing news, information and entertainment to a barren landscape, including launching his first network in Afghanistan in 2002. His work has empowered civil society in Afghanistan with his defense of women's rights, earning him a place in the BBC's 2015 10 men globally champion, championing gender equality. Many of the rights and freedoms we take for granted, the speech, expression, the press, the vote, education, are lacking elsewhere and the cause of tension, suppression and oppression. The challenge for Australia, despite our rights and freedoms, is twofold. First, to ensure we do not lose sight of the risks of extremism domestically, focus on what is necessary to maintain resilience where those threats emerge, and to ensure that a major element of that resilience involves countering the threat while not allowing our society to fracture. Second, to ensure we maintain an awareness of extremism overseas and possible impacts on our region, including by working with partner countries to both support human rights abroad and counter terrorism and extremism at their source, so that the risk of spread to our region or country is reduced. The themes are critical to the work of ASPE's CT, CV, CVE and Resilience Program, led by Karcher Theodorakis. The aim of today's event is to focus on Afghanistan. Why Afghanistan still matters to Australia, despite the withdrawal just over a year ago. Why it still matters, despite the top security threat to Australia being foreign interference and espionage, and the gravest concern the region has is with major power competition. Just because foreign interference and the rise of China are dominant security priorities does not mean that terrorism and extremism have ceased to be a threat. It is worth pointing out that it was only five years ago that the focus of Australia's defence, security and foreign policy was on countering ISIL. It was the top and dominant intelligence and political issue. And it was only 31 July this year when Al Qaeda leader Al Zarahiri was killed in a CT operation in the Afghan capital, Kabul. Meanwhile, we've, we have the rise of what is now being called single issue violent extremism, less ideologically based than Islamist extremism or white supremacy, and with confounding collectives of people who do not seem to share much in common other than grievance on a particular issue such as vaccine or mask mandates. It actually means we need to have even stronger national resilience. The federal government working with states and civil society to tackle the issues in Australia, as well as working with key international partners to address what remain global issues of concern. I know you'll get a lot out of today. With that, I know you're all looking forward to Saad's remarks, his experience and his views on what the international community needs to do to keep us both safe and free. Many thanks, Saad. Uh, thank you, Justin. Good to be back in Australia, albeit digitally. Um, it's been a it's been one hell of uh, a year for us um, Afghans, um, and uh, uh, most of us, uh, including folks in Australia who witnessed the withdrawal, can safely say that it was handled exceptionally badly. Not necessarily the way it was executed, but the entire process. Um, as I often say, it was not the, the decision to leave, but rather the way the Americans left, which has left such a scar on the country. And 
you know, the, the reality today is that the Taliban are firmly in control of Afghanistan. Perhaps the first time the government has uh, in Kabul has been in so much control since probably going back to 2006. Now, there are massive risks, obviously, um, including terrorism, but also some opportunities, uh, not just for Afghanistan, but for the rest of the world. Um, I do want to go back to 2002 when we first uh, returned to, to Afghanistan from Melbourne, Australia, uh, with, along with my siblings. Um, and I want to describe Afghanistan to you in those days uh, and how much it has been transformed by the presence of the international community and the money that went into the country. Uh, in 2002, Afghanistan's population was 20 million. Literacy rate was at 20 percent. Median age was 17 and 80% of the population was living in rural areas. Uh, what we confronted, what we saw on the ground was a nation, an, a zombie nation of sorts. Five years of Taliban rule, no media, no civil society, no women's rights. Um, uh, the country was, was basically in a, in a state of shock. Um, and what followed was for us an exceptional opportunity, but also for the country. Um, and. Um, and we developed this very small media business. It started off fairly small with a uh, local radio station, and then we expanded to television. We went national, um, and basically, in, in a very short space of time, Afghanistan was perhaps one of the most engaged countries media-wise. Uh, today, something like 85% of households have access to a TV set. 95% of the population has access to a radio set. Uh, the country is more engaged than ever before. Uh, perhaps the most isolated country in 2002, and now today one of the most engaged countries. The, you know, we obviously faced many challenges, both from conservatives and corrupt liberals, um, and we've paid a pretty heavy price. Uh, we've lost 12 colleagues over the last 20 years, including dozens injured, some permanently handicapped. And um, but. Taking a step back and looking, looking back at Afghanistan and um, and the country and um, and how much it has been transformed, it, the, the the presence of the international community has 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 completely and totally uh, transformed the nation and its people. Uh, I'll, I'll just briefly, you know, some numbers. Um, life expect expectancy has gone from forty odd to like sixty five. Uh, literacy rate has doubled. But the younger population, uh, population's literacy rates at like 75%. The country has been vastly urbanized. You're dealing with a very aspirational population. Median age is still very, very uh, uh, um, young, 18 and 18. And today, it is this population that's been transformed, that's pushing back against the Taliban. It's the women's organizations that are protesting. It's the media, uh, albeit, you know, we're much more careful nowadays. That's pushing back. It's this the civil society that sort of grew, that grew, that developed uh, over the last twenty years. That's that's challenging the Taliban, um, and and Afghanistan is not going away. Um, uh, our population growth is is, is at two and a half percent, two and a half to three percent. It it is still the youngest population out, uh, outside of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and if you look at the numbers, uh, the population is set to grow to close to 100 million by 2060, 2070. It'll be the 16th largest country on the planet. Um, and so there are opportunities and there are risks. Um, the Taliban's return was expected, but it caught most of us by surprise uh, because of the speed uh, in which the government collapsed. Uh, many of us had assumed the government would have two or three months after the withdrawal of the Americans, but the Ashraf Ghani decided to leave while the Americans were still there, which fast-tracked the collapse of the state. Um, and today, uh, we are faced with, with a tsunami of, of catastrophes. Um, because of the severe shortage in high food prices, um, more than half the population is vulnerable to starvation. 97% of the population is expected to fall below the poverty line by the end of the year. Um, the, the world decided to freeze Afghanistan's reserve bank assets uh, worth 9 billion. Um, and most of these problems started even before the withdrawal of the Americans. Uh, it's, a, it's been a byproduct of many decades of conflict, uh, internally displaced people, 
bad governance and economic management. And all of this was compounded by the uh, pandemic and of course, climate change. Um, and as we always say, uh, the Taliban have not lost an opportunity to lose an opportunity. Over the last 12 months, they have had opportunities to engage the world. They could have opened up schools. They could have created a more inclusive government. Um, and they could have even dealt with the international terrorist uh, organizations in a more decisive manner, which they have failed. And, and that has certainly has compounded the problems of Afghanistan. Um, now, as you in particular know, uh, that groups such as Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations um, remain active in the country. Um, uh, the Taliban claim that they have been defanged, uh, while others uh, in the international community Community believe that they're being trained and they're still active. Now that's a debate that will continue. Um, and but there are reasons as to why the Taliban continue to host them. Uh, I think a uh, they use them as leverage when negotiating with the Western uh, uh, or the international community. There are historical ties to these groups, uh, which are deep, including intermarriages, and of course the, their expectations uh, from the base that they're not abandoned. Um, now, al zawiris killing perhaps now uh, provide the opportunity to move uh, to move on in tackling these groups as a major obstacle has been removed by the Americans. ISIS, on the other hand, is a much, much uh, bigger threat. Um, it, uh, uh, it's getting stronger by the day um, and the Taliban's actions, namely the targeting of former government, former government forces, and uh, perhaps its inability to adhere to the very strict Islamic uh, um, principles of the Taliban have swelled the ranks of the Daesh, of the uh, Khorasan, which is uh, the offshoot of ISIS in Afghanistan. And right now it is at its most lethal. The Taliban have had some successes. Um, security generally is much better. You can travel across the country. Uh, they're attempting to help the private sector. Uh, their budget for the year is two billion, which is pretty impressive, given that the previous government collected two point five billion. Um, they don't expect a deficit. Um, they have streamlined exports of products. Uh, they're attempting to uh, to to be more engaged with the private sector. Uh, they corruption is down, uh, um, uh, much, much better environment in terms of governance. Um, and so that ha also has to be acknowledged. What to do now? The Taliban is not a monolithic movement. There are pragmatists within the government. Um, and what I've been advocating amongst, uh, and many others have, as well, is that we have to engage with Afghanistan, which includes the current Taliban government. Uh, because I think if we don't, uh, the risks uh, uh, far outweigh the, uh, the, uh, the gains we'll have by not engaging. Uh, Afghanistan has obviously threatens countries like Australia in three areas, uh, terrorism, refugees, and drugs. Um, and will they abandon these terrorist organizations? That remains to be seen. Uh, and engaging, I think it certainly will give us the opportunity to, to test that. And uh, obviously, the last thing the world would want to see is a total collapse of the uh, of the Afghan state. And of course, Afghanistan also, I think we have to reassess as to why Afghanistan, even up until 2021, uh, was a client or a frontier state, uh, fully reliant on the international community. What can Afghanistan do to create a viable, uh, sustainable economy? Um, these are questions that we Afghans are asking ourselves, and I think the international community could also help. Um, now, Australia, I th think, still has a mission and uh, somewhat engaged in Afghanistan, like perhaps most of the other uh, Western countries. Uh, and, and I'm certain Australia still helps on, on, on the humanitarian front. But I think Afghanistan also needs help in terms of development, or as the international community calls it now, uh, basic needs, in order for us to create a more resilient economy and to help with livelihoods. Otherwise, every year we face the same issue in terms of the uh, people starving to death. Um, the, 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 the Americans managed to pull out 200,000 Afghans in late August, but you have to remember that 40 million Afghans still remain inside the country. And if Australia doesn't step in, if the US doesn't step in, others will. And certainly the Chinese are very active, as, as are the Russians and others. 
the 20 years in Afghanistan has created a, a, a country that's vastly different to the one uh, that we all inherited in 2002. And maybe we've already won by transforming the country. And it's now time to step back in if possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Saad, for, for this um, really, really incisive keynote. It's a real privilege to hear from you. Uh, my name is Katya Sidorakis. I head the CT program at ASPI. And I'm very pleased that for our discussion tonight, we have two distinguished panelists who can speak from really extensive experience and close involvement in Afghanistan's trajectory along Saad. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce Siobhan New, a former ABC correspondent in South Asia. And Matt Anderson, the current director of the Australian War Memorial, is also a former ambassador to Afghanistan. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Now, as we're approaching the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and the first anniversary of the withdrawal from Afghanistan behind us, it's an opportune time to ask where we're at in this counterterrorism journey that we've embarked on over 20 years ago. And counterterrorism has been identified as an ongoing vital interest in Afghanistan by the Biden administration as well as the Australian government. For example, the former um, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne has at the last Quad meeting in February 2020 has stressed again the importance of um, UN Resolution 202593, um, that Afghan territory may not be used to threaten or attack any country, and, she and the UN reiterated the importance of combating terrorism in Afghanistan. And as um, alluded to by Saad, there are some interesting dynamics going on, and, and we can also see that in that UN security resolution that it was um, adopted by 13 members and two abstained, which was China and the Russian Federation. And I think that tells us something about the landscape that we're faced with. And amidst these shifting strategic priorities, we will always need a rigorous approach to counterterrorism. And terrorist activity may ebb and flow, and its immediate relevance in comparison to other geostrategic or national security threats. But at the same time, in highlighting the, the ongoing importance, we have to also see that the policy dilemma should go for governments, especially former NATO and coalition nations, should actually go way beyond just counterterrorism and national security interests. A recent article in the New Yorker called Afghanistan, the foreign case, policy case study from hell with policy choices for the US and partners described as morally complex and excruciatingly hard. The loss of Afghanistan to the Taliban with its wider strategic and humanitarian consequences has to be recognized as a serious long-term challenge for, to Australia's interests more broadly. That's the premise of this discussion tonight. And in the words of the late Senator Kimberly Kitching, Australians, especially the brave men and women of the ADF who risked everything and did so much good, our diplomats and aid workers want answers to some big questions about our role in Afghanistan. And this is what we're trying to do here tonight in this discussion. Thank you. And I'll address, um, Saad, if I may, I'll address the first question to you. Um, you've recently written that we need greater clarity about the roots of the current mess and also creative new approaches to dealing with its poorly understood role as the Taliban and the region. And seeing that Australia has no longer representation on the ground, perspectives like yours are really invaluable. And I'd like to ask you that even though our governments do not recognize the Taliban as the legitimate government of Afghanistan, we have to accept that they're in power. How do we therefore get a better understanding of the Taliban and what kind of creative approaches you had in mind for dealing with them, including um, ensuring your media company can remain? Thank you. Well, obviously, I think civil society and uh, media organizations and women's rights organizations, educators, uh, uh, people like us are vulnerable and we need all the help we can get. Um, engaging with the Taliban can only be achieved if you actually sit and talk to them. And one of the problems we have today is that engagement happens in Doha with some of their representatives who are not 
the true power brokers. And one of the things we've advocated is people go to Kabul and meet with some of the key figures. The Minister of Interior, the Minister of Defense, various other individuals um, who have the levers of power. And one of the things, one of the problems that for the, for the Taliban leaders in Kabul, especially the younger generation, I refer to as the princelings, whose fathers were important Taliban officials in the 90s, is that they perhaps need in international engagement as much as the international community needs engagement with them. They probably need to have support both domestically and internationally in order to be able to prevail against their more conservative um, um, fellow Taliban. Uh, and I think that's important. But also, I think it's important because uh, there's much Australia can help with, not just on the humanitarian front and also on, on development, on education. Um, and 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 this is where the Taliban, the the people of Afghanistan need that help, not necessarily just the Taliban government. Thank you, and I think it's important. Again, you drew that distinction that we're trying to bring out that there's obviously a security angle, and we, we need to have a focus on security and stability. But at the same time, that shouldn't come at the expense of considering equally um, the future um, for for Afghanistan and its people. And maybe that's a good. Um, segue into turning to Shaman to to um, your experience there. There's obviously a lot has been said about the withdrawal and the devastating effects for the people of Afghanistan. And Saad, many others have referred to the courage of the Afghan people, in particular women. Um, may have seen the images of, of protests going on and women really pushing back against Taliban power. Um, what can or should nations like Australia do, based on your experience, when, when we keep our eye on trying to maintain the rights of Afghan women that everyone has fought for. And so we don't lose those gains um, made over the last 20 years. Do you have any thoughts or even concrete ideas for how we can, how we can support Afghan civil society? Yeah, you're right, Katja, it was one of those justifications that we kept hearing for two decades that we're helping women and children. And when Saad says things like the younger generation now has a 75% literacy rate, that's, you know, that's one of the success stories out of that time. Um, but the one thing the international community has to do is maintain pressure on the Taliban uh, to to stop rolling back women's rights because you can't understate how rapid and brutal the subjugation of women has been just in the last year. The Taliban have issued something like 30 decrees around what women can and can't do. Um, and that suggests, you know, a bit of coordination at the highest levels of the Taliban leadership. Um, they certainly haven't issued as many decrees on how to fix the economic woes or the, you know, the humanitarian crises that the country is suffering from. And the important thing is that those two things, you know, Australia and, and you know, um, the international community is very focused on this humanitarian crisis, you know, half the population on the brink of starvation, 19 million people. But the two are linked, you know, if, if half of the population can't work, can't travel easily to get food, access to health care, um, not to mention education, um, then, you know, that's only going to worsen the crises that are already manifesting. Um, and the other thing the international community, I think, has to be aware of is the fact that the Taliban will probably use something like um, high school education for girls as a bargaining chip. So as they seek, um, you know, international legitimacy, um, you know, they promised at the peace talks that they would allow girls an education. They reneged on that and, you know, delayed, delayed and came up with nonsensical excuses like they couldn't decide what the uniform standards should be. Um, but, you know, it's not enough. Even if they do use that as leverage in negotiations, there has to be more that's done to reverse this horrible, really brutal uh, rollback of women's rights. Mm. And I think it's so important that you mention and also drew out this distinction that I think the US is still the biggest um, donor of age, but without a long-term strategic vision, actually understanding how those things are interlinked, we won't actually get anywhere on that road to sustainable progress. And that's, Matt, that's where I'd like to draw on your um, insights too. As a former ambassador to Afghanistan, it must have been really devastating for you to see the loss of all those hard fought gains, especially also when there was a diplomatic process underway. 
um, that's supposed to enshrine some of those things, but then that didn't really come to fruition. And I think it's good to, to use that to broaden that scope from just mere narrow security considerations and to actually foreign policy and, and diplomatic options. So how can we honour the promises of support to the Afghan people without empowering the Taliban from your perspective? Um, well, I think the first promise we need to honour are those that we've offered visas to and bring them home. That's the first thing we need to do. And, and I think through forums like tonight, we just remind people that there, this is ongoing work and I have every confidence in, you know, whether it's Home Affairs or, or DFAT that's engaged in this, that they're working as hard as they can, but we need to make sure that we hold their feet to the fire to get at all those that we've given a promise of a new life to because many of them are still waiting there, if not them, their families. That's the first thing I'd say. Um, I guess the other thing, I always think before I deployed the first time, um, Bill Maley reminded me that uh, it's not the Taliban, it's the Taliban's plural. Mm. You know, when we talk about the Taliban, is it is the Quetta Shura we're talking about? Is it those those in Doha that we're talking about, the, the point that was just made? Um, or is it the, you know, the part-time Taliban who are farmers for six months of the year and, uh, and a Taliban for the other six months of the year? And the they're princelings, they're like the princelings. princelings. <laughs> and so for me, how do you maintain the pressure on them? Um, I would stop and you think, well, what is it they want? And I think for me, two things are very obvious. Um, what the Taliban, and in particular what the princelings would want, is recognition, international recognition. So we have to extract a price for that. The other thing that they're going to want is the release of the, um, the cash reserves, again, that uh, yeah. Saad was talking about. Um, because, you know, we have to extract a price for that, you know, in terms of making sure, and, and it is... It, it is social. It is making sure that, that there, there are, if not media freedoms, there is access, you know, reasonable access to media. So, you know, it was fascinating to me that when I watched, you know, the Taliban the last time they were in power, they were stringing up televisions and VCRs, you know, in the main streets of Kabul. And now I'm looking at Taliban representatives with smartphones sticking out of their pockets. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a way for us to use um, technology to communicate with the people to ensure that this very, very rich harvest of, of young men and women who have been educated for 20 years, that, that we don't allow that capital to waste, um, I think is, is terribly important. But then, you know, I was in Uruzgan in 2015-16 and I remember the governor said to me one day, um, and it should be my bumper sticker, but he just basically said the alternative for the Taliban and poppies is jobs. So, you know, this is about growing economies and creating jobs. This has got to be where we're focused. And the only way Australia can engage at this stage, and yes, we should be looking to engage, but remember if we're engaging in Doha or if we're engaging in Pakistan, we're not engaging all of the Taliban or even those with the levers. They're mm. probably sitting in Kabul right now. Yeah. So, so extracting a price for any negotiations, I think, is terribly, terribly important. Um, and, you know, they're, they're going to seek legitimacy and um, we have to make sure that that's not given away. Yeah. And I think in terms of, you know, having those levers of influence, I think we often forget when we're probably rightfully so sort of surrendered to these very pessimistic um, and realistic um, assessments where I say we're kind of back to square one to where mm. we started like 20 years ago. It was all for nothing. But at the same time, even if strategically the outcomes sort of went probably nowhere or possibly it's still we're in a very changed environment. Back then, I mean, how many how many percentages of, of Afghan households would have had a connection to the outside world through technology? And look at what's happened, and and how how even outside of Afghanistan, the civil society keeps going, and media organisations are trying to continue to operate and stay in contact. And I think that's a factor in the environment that we can work to our advantage. Well, there's there's certainly an interconnectedness. Just just over the last couple of days, just to see what was going on there. I jumped on some of the Facebook posts that I, Facebook, you know, sites that I used to use when we were over there. One of them's called Kabul Security Now mm -hmm. and used to tell you when something went pop, you know, you want to know which police district it was in and that's how you'd find out very, very quickly. You'd have that situational awareness. And they're still talking about things. They're still, you know, um, asking for jobs. They're still asking for information. There is another network of communication outside the formal Taliban communication network that, um, that most people can gain access to. Um, or we should be encouraging those, um, you know, the, the spreading of information, the spreading of knowledge, the underground ca classrooms that we hear about. You know, you do hear about women still being educated because that's ultimately the future. There are two sides to that increase in kind of technology and tactics, though, because when I think of this term that's bandied around Taliban 2.0, um, I don't think of nice Taliban. I think of Taliban that are um, smarter and yeah. more wired, as you say. Uh, they yeah, can use the media. And I was astounded at how 
adeptly they exploited foreign media in particular during the withdrawal period and just after. Uh, and they also are able to um, crack down on people using digital means. So, for instance, a, a friend of mine who works in, in the media, I'll say, uh, says that, you know, in Kabul, yes, the, those networks are still there that are feeding information back and forth. Everyone has a smartphone, but it's not the same in some of the other provinces and the Taliban will still go door to door um, and they're quite adept at taking people's phones and um, because of that, we're not hearing about um, attacks outside of Kabul necessarily. So there were, um, there's been a recent spate of assassinations of um, high profile uh, pro-Taliban clerics and the information flow is not as steady and trustworthy as it was. Um, and one of the things, I'm not sure how it's achievable, but one of the things that, that we can do to help the media landscape is um, educate or assist Afghans in protecting their own safety when they choose to be sources mm -hmm. because it's very, um, you know, it's a literate population now amongst um, younger Afghans, but it's, it's a challenge for them to kind of clean their digital footprints, I suppose. Yep. And so... Um, you know, in this ever shriveling civil society free media space, which people are holding on to, you know, um, with everything they've got, what's left of it, um, there are there are still a lot of challenges just around the control of information and the Taliban 2.0 have proven rather successful at disinformation as well. Mm. And that's such an important point in this, you know, coming back to the, we're, we're faced with a different landscape that we can shape to our advantage, but we need to be really savvy. I think there was a New York Times article a while ago that was talking about how Twitter, when Twitter spaces came into existence, it was, at first it was seen as this really invaluable tool for Afghan civil society to develop. People were having those debates that you're supposed to have in a healthy sort of budding democracy about, you know, what defines us as a nation, especially a society in sort of a post, for lack of a better term, post-conflict trajectory of, you know, reconciliation and moving forward. But then what, what, was in the beginning sort of healthy contestation about people saying, no, actually, I'm, I'm in support of the Taliban being in power. It then turned into exactly those. It was used as a, as a, a space for repression because then people who had been quite vocal against the Taliban would get a knock on their door. Yeah. And I think that kind of shows, too, this responsibility of, well, who can set those rules? There are new actors here, and we're talking about corporations with their own set of uh, guidelines, and how do, we, how do we shape this space? Because if it's a national jurisdiction as well, then a de facto government would have some say over what happens. And, and I think the pandemic has also shown that um, Taliban, I think Facebook had to restore some of um, the Taliban channels just to, as, as the de facto government, just, for example, its Ministry of Health, to, to allow necessary information in those rural areas that had no other internet bandwidth other than what Facebook is actually offering um, to sort of badly connected areas. And I think there's some really, really interesting dilemmas. Now, I wonder, um, Matt, too, if, you know, moving now to your current role as, as director of the Australian War Memorial, when we're, there would have been so many insights that, you know, you mentioned Aura's gone, um, and during ADF um, operations in general, and this intimate knowledge of the country of being, being there for so long and having this involvement and investment. When we're talking about this ongoing support, are there ways how we can include those, those insights better in the process um, and as we're coming to terms as a nation with 20 years of some say failed efforts or blood sweat and tears poured into Afghanistan and um, the war memorial especially not just being a museum but also a space for education and broader civic engagement. Um, so you talk about education we get about 130,000 school kids a year yep. through the war memorial we have over a million visitors a year um, and you know, I guess the first thing I can do and will do and am doing, I hope, um, with our veterans is, I was mentioning before we came on, on um, up onto the stage, was that I hosted a um, mentoring task force one, their 10th anniversary, and a young man asked me at that 10th anniversary whether um, what we did in Afghanistan was worth it and was did we make a difference? And these are pretty healthy questions for a young man to be asking. And I was mentioning before that all I can say is... And as I said to them, and I'll say to the audience, is that um, it was both my lived experience and I had both the privilege and the perspective of arriving into Afghanistan in 2015, so five years after they left. And the first thing I know, because I was still 
um, you know, getting the intelligence reporting was that our enemy, you know, the Taliban feared, feared what they did and the way in which they operated. The second thing to note was that the, um, the coalition partners that we worked with, um, you know, valued the contribution that we made significantly. And the third thing was, you know, when you're down in Oruzgan or Kandahar or Jalalabad, was the local governors were asking for more Australian support and assistance. So I could only say to the young man that day, I don't know what mission success looks like, but was it worth it? Absolutely, you did. The job that was asked of you, the way in which it was asked by the government of the day, you said with courage and distinction, and they should be very, very proud of it. And that's that's my that's not the government issue talking points. I don't get them anymore, Andy. Um, that's just my lived experience of the the young men and women who did everything that was asked of them. It was the government's decision that they deployed, and it was the government's decision that they came home. But I think you know your point about how do we capture the experiences of the young men and women is that we're doing that right now. Actually, we have a very good um, oral history program where we're encouraging those who come home uh, to talk to us and to just talk about whatever it is that they'd like to talk about in terms of, you know, the, the highs and the lows of, of a deployment to Afghanistan, who they worked with, what they achieved, um, you know, sort of first and last impressions. Um, but the other thing, the really, really powerful thing we do for any veterans that are in the room is I would encourage you, um, we have what we call is the TK wall, the Tarrancott wall, which has the um, the welcome to Tarrancott blast, you know, signs from one of the duck and cover bays or the blast walls from TK. And that's now in our hall. And um, we encourage people just to come in and do what soldiers, sailors and aviators have done for 100 years, and that's scratch their names on things. Uh, we did on the pyramids in 1915, so we may as well do it on a, on a wall in the war memorial. Mm -hmm. And people are just leaving their marks to say, I was there. And they're proud of it by association with the 40,000 others that they were there and they're very, very proud of it. So I just want the memorial to be a place where they can have a, a conversation. It's a safe place. The number of times, and I'm in the galleries every day, walking with people every day, and the number of times you can speak to the families of a veteran and as they're telling them a story about their time in, in Afghanistan in particular, and the family will tell me that they're hearing it for the first time because the memorial is, as you rightly say, we are first and foremost a memorial, uh, we are a museum, and we're a, you know, we are an archive as well. And I think what I would say is you know, the point about the memorial is hopefully for our veterans out there for and you know, our diplomats and our aid workers is that it's a place where we can provide both the recognition and the meaning that i think they so richly deserve yeah yeah i think it's it's, it's quite profound to see something sort of scribbled in walls like graffiti a lot you know i think there's a lot of focus now so and when we're looking at you know not just anthropologically, but in terms of foreign policy, actually understanding the perspectives of people on the ground. You look to graffiti, such mm. as, for example, in, in, um, in, in, I think it's in Ramallah or in the West Bank, where a lot of is made of, you know, what, what goes on, like graffiti gets sprayed on those walls. And, or similar, you have, a, I think, a traveling exhibition where um, the tattoos of, of um, former and serving soldiers, and they tell a story. And, and just like those experiences mm. are sort of inscribed on the skin, I think, that, that's a nice kind of contrast when we're talking about foreign policy and maybe what well, also you mentioned about some longer term lenses on what's actually going on. Like you, you said in the beginning, so like Afghanistan will not go away and neither will those experiences for those. And we need to link that to when we make policy, I reckon. Yeah, and Katja, the, the stories are still unfolding, yes. particularly with regard to the visas for interpreters, as you mentioned that. So, um, you know, this time last year when Kabul fell, I was actually really moved and quite stunned by the degree of uh, disappointment and anger expressed by veterans. Um, there were a lot of texts going back and forth yeah. with people, um, you know, letting it all out but checking up on each other as well. Like it, it did, it was kind of a quite a depressing episode to watch from afar. And there are so many veterans uh, and, and journalists as well um, who have been trying and some are still trying to get their colleagues, their Afghan interpreters out of the country. I know of many veterans who are now supporting uh, interpreters who have arrived in Australia mm -hmm. with money and furniture and housing help and all that, all that um, paraphernalia. Um, and there are just, there are people, I, I know one young fellow who spent a year trying to get someone out, trying to get them through the gates in August last year, turn back, um, all sorts of, uh, you know, human trafficking efforts. Uh, his child was born at the Pakistani border. So the stories are still going. And I think we, we were very late in coming to the Afghanistan war story publicly. I know Brendan Nelson did amazing work, your predecessor, by 
putting the war in the gallery before it was finished. Um, but it was also, uh, you know, I, I've heard historians say that it, it was easier to get information from Gallipoli, despite censorship and having to, you know, get stuff back and forth on a ship, than it was to get information from Afghanistan in those early years. So um, just because, you know, we've we've ended the war, it doesn't mean that that's, that story isn't still still going for a lot of Australians. Mm. Great. I think I have a feeling that may come up again in audience questions. And before we move into that stage, Saad, if I may just ask one more question. Um, you mentioned in your in your address that um, other actors moving in and about the strategic vacuum. What would your message be to to governments like the Australian government and policymakers to not let this happen? Um, in terms of this longer term perspective of keeping the future of Afghanistan and how that's tied to also our interests, not just security interests, but in in a more comprehensive way, what what what's your message to governments here or to 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 Australia in general? Sorry, is, is, is I think is the picture frozen? Right? The connection frozen? Oh. Maybe. Yeah, maybe we'll just move on to um, the audience questions then. Um, I believe we have some mics going around. If you um, would like to identify yourself with your name and your affiliation, raise your hand. We've got some microphones at the back there. Any questions? Yes, over here, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Jeremy Simpson, I want to sound a bit of a critical note at this point, and I hope I'll be forgiven for saying this. I remember sitting in this room in 2019 and participating in, as always, a very informative and interesting seminar about Afghanistan, in which a lot was said, as is being said today, um, about our achievements in Afghanistan and a tendency to refer to the numbers. Now, I recall saying uh, at that seminar that maybe the numbers are not really telling the picture of what actually went on um, during that 20 year period. And while obviously great things were achieved, great sacrifices were made, I'm not here to disparage anything that was done by anybody in that situation, but it has been known for some quite considerable period of time that most of the statistics, for instance, the statistic that 10 million um, Afghan young people are in education and so on, it's known that those statistics are, I don't want to use a word like spurious, but let's say unreliable. Okay, and this has been known for some considerable period of time. And I guess my, my substantive question in terms of moving forward is, to what extent do we need to acknowledge, yes, the achievements, but also we need to acknowledge what was not achieved mm. and the shortfalls and the problems. The elephant in the room, of course, being corruption, but um, I don't refer to that as Afghan corruption. I refer to that as the corruption that was created by those 20 years of intervention and the vast amounts of aid and development that flowed into Afghanistan, and which in a lot of cases seem to have generated a lot of reports, a lot of policy, a lot of statistics where these are known to be unreliable, highly unreliable, but where the concrete specific outcomes on the ground for the Afghan community were simply not there. And I think it's arguable that that was a key factor contributing to the speed of the collapse of the Islamic Republic. So the question is essentially, do we actually need to look a little bit more searchingly at ourselves and maybe stop talking about achievements and talking about the things we got wrong? I'm sorry, I am sounding a critical note, I know, but please, back to you. I'm happy to answer that one. I think for, certainly for me, um, one thing I would say is that you'd probably agree that a significant it was a significant number of kids that were educated, girls and women that were educated, um, you know, from 2001 to 2020, um, had the Taliban, you know, had they remained in place, it would have been a vastly different number. There were, it was a significant achievement, the education of women and girls, and still is. Um, you just have to look at Parliament and the, the calibre of the women that I used to engage with uh, through that education. But I think absolutely one of the lessons we have to learn um, 
as, as a government and as a Western uh, contributor, I think more than anything else is, you know, to affect the change um, that needed to be affected after the Taliban in 2001, 19 years isn't a very long time, right? In order to affect real and lasting change in a country as sophisticated, uh, complicated and, and sort of challenging as Afghanistan, it's the work of generations. And yet, you know, the, the, the question or the statement that I hear most is we ran out of patience. And I, the question for me is, did we ever go in and into it knowing? Did we fight did we fight one war 20 times over 20 years or did we fight one war for 20 years or did we go in and say, righto, we're going to stay for however long it takes to affect real and lasting change for the betterment of all Afghans? I think that's the lesson we need to, to go into this thing. When you go into them, you've got to say, we are here for a very, very long time. And I think that we were, we were and of course this is the case in, in the West, we're going to be driven by electoral cycles we're going to be driven by media cycles. We're certainly going to, I think the figure I heard today was the Americans invested a trillion dollars. Uh, at any stage, you know, you say we're not critical. Read a Seagar report, especially an investigator, you know, investigator general from uh, Afghan Reconstruction. Just read any one of his ports, reports just to read uh, his investigations into how money was spent, where money was spent, and the limited effect that it achieved. So we weren't, we weren't uncrit. Sorry? Yeah. Seagar was saying that. Yeah. And there's a wonderful Taliban saying, um, you know, that's oft repeated, uh, you've got the watches, but we've got the time. And they said that they would outlast um, NATO and the US. And we probably were a little too confident of our ability to affect change fast. And they did. They did outlast um, the, the, the invasion pretty much. But look, there are... There are success stories that I think, and, and they're not necessarily, um, you know, related to the military and certainly uh, heavily corrupted government um, did nothing at all to help. But um, one of the biggest success stories is the establishment in Afghanistan of a free and independent press. And I'm, I'm sure Saad would like to speak more to this, but that is something that, um, you know, has been left behind by the international mm. community as well as Afghans themselves who are now, um, you know, holding on to the, to the kind of the, the small amount of power they have um, with that free and independent press, no matter how much um, pressure it's under. Um, Saad might have um, something to say about how, how significant that was as well for Afghanistan to come out of that 20-year period with, with a functioning fourth estate. Yes, Saad, it's good to have you back on there. Can you, um, is your connection working? Were you able to? I think so. I, I, I think so. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. We just had a question before you may have missed that. Um, it was pointing to, and you know, when we're looking at um, sort of the numbers, often during the last 20 years, they were used to kind of create a picture that was maybe unduly optimistic and when we're sort of in this reckoning and trying to look forward we also need to look at what actually didn't work and the SIGA reports were for example mentioned but then um, Siobhan was was pointing to one of the solid achievements being you know the, the press being established and that's an ongoing thing and that as an avenue forward and if you could speak to you know what can be done now even though there is no physical presence on the ground in Afghanistan, in, in many cases, what can be done? What can the international community and individual governments or civil society do to support um, organizations, small, even smaller? There are a lot of, I believe there are a lot of um, grassroots organizations, also media by Afghan women, for Afghan women, which is, which is really quite um, outstanding to think that and, and maybe drawing more attention to that. Yeah, I'm not... Uh, the, 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 can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can hear yeah. you very well. Yeah. No. Okay. The gentleman is absolutely right that um, billions uh, have been squandered. But I think people were have always been well intentioned, including the Australian government. Um, but but there is no doubt that uh, the, the byproduct uh, of this in, this much engagement and so much money going into the country was the creation of a rentier or a client state. And if you look at the histories of other similar states, whether it was in Vietnam or Iran, it always ends in tears. But that's not to say that 
that presence or that engagement did not transform the country. But, but I think we have to look back. I mean, as an Afghan, we always ask the question, what is the vision for the country? I mean, we can't just sustain the economy on international handouts. I mean, no one wants a beggar government. Our government was more beholden to folks in Brussels, London, or Washington, or Canberra than they felt beholden to the Afghan nation. Ashraf Ghani never had a press conference. He never took questions from the Afghan media. He did interviews, but he never did a press conference. He looked at uh, us as a, you know, the, uh, as a media sector with contempt. You know, he was happy to please people in Washington, but not the Afghans themselves. In terms of transformation of the country, <clears throat> we had eight women working in our news department in uh, 2021. Today, we have uh, 21 women. We've actually have, we've, uh, it's gone up threefold in terms of the number of women we have working for us. Um, which is extraordinary. Uh, they work, uh, you know, obviously they have great difficulties, but nonetheless, they continue their work in front and behind the cameras. We have uh, 30 odd reporters across the country. We actually have more of a presence, uh, national presence today than we did before. Now, a lot of them, smaller media organizations are going to suffer. They're more vulnerable. They don't have the sort of the, the loudspeaker we do in terms of our outlets that we can cover the arrest of individuals, uh, our own individuals, or other individuals. But the small organizations are much more vulnerable. And I think it, it's true that the Taliban are using technology to target people. It, it's, it's, it's a cat and mouse game between us and the Taliban. And longer term, uh, with the tra trajectory we're on, I don't think is going to end well for any of, anyone in the country. But within the Taliban also, there is this battle between the hardcore um, sort of North Korea type, um, uh, you know, uh, people advocating for that type of government and a slightly more liberal, you know, I, I use that term, uh, uh, obviously not quite liberal, but pragmatic elements within the Taliban. It's, it's, the game is far from over and that's why I think engagement will, will work uh, and could work or should be tried. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, please. Thanks. Uh, to get to the first point, I think it, it really was an issue about strategic patience. I, I was with the Americans in 2012 in Kandahar. We had uh, 20,000 soldiers in RC South, uh, coalition soldiers, plus a similar number of Afghans. So that, that's a full-on war by any stretch of the imagination. That was repeated across all of the regional commands. So, uh, you know, Ten years before the uh, withdrawal, we were still fighting a, a full-on war. And I met with Amrila Saleh many times, and he would say that, you know, the West has kind of brought this problem to Afghanistan and it has an obligation to stay for the long term. And I, I think there is some some merit in his view, but, uh, you know, the strategic patience wasn't there. But uh, in 2015, I was one of... Uh, Matt's defence attaches. I used to go out in Kabul nearly every day, and you know, if you drive around Kabul in those days, you would see girls and boys going to school, the morning shift and the afternoon shift. So there was a lot of progress being made, and I guess what I would say, what was left behind, was this kind of glimpse of what things might be uh, across a whole range of sectors. You know, the media, schooling for women. But uh, I guess my point is now we have an autocratic government. Uh, and uh, I think it's a problem we have in the West is we overestimate the levers that we have. Uh, and uh, in fact, with the autocratic government who don't really care what West thinks, they've actually got the levers. And there's a couple of things that are important to us, the media freedom, uh, the, the rights of women and girls. And I think uh, the, the point is we have no choice but to engage with the Taliban uh, and really... Uh, with understanding that they hold all the cards and that they're probably this asymmetric relationship and they're probably going to get more than we get but the if we want to start chipping away at some of those things i think we just have to that, that's the only option we have there's no uh, possibility of a, of a regime change in the uh, in, in the short term so that's the government we have and uh it's a, a bit like turkey uh you might not like what president erdogan does or who president erdogan is but until this recent economic crisis, he was the most popular 
a politician in Turkey in, in, in a legitimate uh, electoral sense. Uh, and and he, his views are not what we would have. And I remember talking to an Afghan colonel one day. We would live in them counter ID devices to save their lives. And he told me straight out that the Taliban come back, won't make much difference to him. So, um, and so, so it proves. So I think the vulnerable populations have a very small voice. And I guess my view is that we have but no choice but to you know, talk to the Taliban, engage with them, knowing that they're going to get more out of it than us. But we might get these incremental gains, keep those flames alive, uh, and you know, over the longer term, hopefully get to something better. I think we also overestimate the internal unity of the Taliban, though, and that's something that Saad's also alluded to. There's lots of factions. Uh, Fighting in decentralised provinces is very different to having a hierarchical centralised government. Um, even on the matter of al-Qaeda, and we were going to um, talk a bit on, on counterterrorism. there are members of the Taliban who support al-Qaeda being in country and there are members of the Taliban who don't. Um, you know, the, the, and it's very strange to be saying things like, oh, um, the more liberal factions of the Taliban... Um, but when you look at the challenges posed to uh, the Taliban by um, ISKP um, and just also being able to maintain that internal stability, the Taliban is not a homogenous group and it needs to achieve not only international legitimacy, but it does need to achieve um, domestic, um, you know, credibility as well by delivering services and, and you know, maintain. Well, they're not doing a great job of it yet, but you know, delivering those basic, those basic provisions. I think we're almost out of time. Um, any final word from um, our other two panellists before we wrap this up? Saad? I, I just want to point out, uh, today uh, we have 30-odd provinces. Uh, schools are open in 12, right? So uh, talk about uh, a decentralised system. The provincial governors just recently in Pakistan announced that they would allow girls to go back to school. So as much as we talk about the ban, actually uh, local authorities and, and a third of the provinces allow girls to go to school. So that highlights the, 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 the fact that it's not a monolithic uh, uh, movement. And, and the, the, uh, uh, our friend who just posed, uh, just made that statement, uh, the last statement is absolutely right. This is an issue that the Afghans need to push back on, whether it's education or unity government or rights of women. This is our responsibility. I think if they're lectured by the international community, their reaction will be uh, more than likely negative. But, but I think that on the periphery, certainly the world can help. You know, you have levers in terms of uh, assistance and so forth. But ultimately, this is a battle for us uh, to win. Thank you, Saad. Any? Well, it's just a shout out to Saad. Actually, I had the honour of being there in a couple of years, and the work that um, that Moby did, that Tolo TV did. I mean. Um, you know, we know as of now, you know, those moderates, those Taliban moderates, the ones that are actually sort of slightly more educated or worldly are watching Turkish soap operas that were, were being broadcast by, uh, by um, Tolo TV. We know that, um, you know, they've, in one sense, you've lifted the veil on some elements of, um, of, of, a, of a free press with, and it might sound really odd, but little things like your... Um, um, Afghanistan star, you know, these, they just brought different, different types of culture and community to Afghanistan, which I still think for many Afghans are going to be very, very hard to give up. Mm. Uh, they embraced them when they were there. It was the most popular television shows in the country across the provinces were brought by, uh, by Tolo and Moby Group. And I just think that there are, you know, the lights being turned on in an awful lot of houses that I don't think will be that quick to turn off. And I'm hoping it's not, because I'm hoping they'll be the moderates that will hold the Taliban hardliners to account, saying there is another way, there is a middle way. I think that's such an important point to end on. And aside from all the other excellent points that were made about the strategic patience and the watches and the time and the, you know, the need for nuance and more comprehensive perspectives, also we can focus on the structures that we tried to build and that got torn down and all the gains that were made. But at the same time, there was a lot of change that mm. happened in that society and individual people, and that's the agency where the agency sits. And I think we shouldn't forget that because you're, you're absolutely right. We have to be realistic. We can't just use beautified figures and, it, you know, that, that reckoning needs to happen. Um, and, I, and I think that's really important to, to because it puts the owners again. It, it, we have moved on from, 
where we're 20 years ago, where it was very much a narrative of we need to come in and liberate Afghan women. Um, there may not be structures there that allow for the rights and the freedoms, but I think this vision and, and the change that went on inside, I think, and what we saw in those protests, especially, I think that's something, not that's where maybe that space that was opened, it has led to something. And I think, it, you know, more fine-grained perspective will, will get us there. Um, again, not in terms of final outcomes and strategic victories, because I think then we'll always fail, but this, this coming back to this kind of letting that circle close, we titled this event as Counterterrorism Beyond the Sand Pit, and I think that's what I tried to mean with that, that it's much more than just narrow security lenses and a focus on counterterrorism, but it's, it's also away from those old paradigms of here we come and you know, military invention, intervention is the way and then we forget about it. Um, it's, it's much broader where, you know, on that continuum, of, if you're Clausewitz in Afficionado, you go from, you know, war is just the continuation of politics and vice versa, that the policy, the struggle for policy outcomes is still ongoing. And maybe that's a good way to end. There was a quote I saw a while ago, which I thought was really fitting. It's a non strategy and it says, battles and wars may end, but interaction between states and individual goes on. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind. And with that really big thank you to Saad and to um, Matt and Siobhan, and thank you to our audience and everyone who's listened online.